Here we're back again. This is part two of today's management versus leadership. Uh, Pastor Rob here. It, we're in Mark chapter five. I hope everything's going good. I want to thank Sean Menchez for my hat. Uh, so uh, uh, let's go to uh, Mark chapter five, verse 21 through 43. And here we have Jesus is just left. We just talked about he was over uh, in the Gadarenes. He dealt with the 6,000 demons and the man that he healed and when he left the naked man who was crazy and driving the town insane was uh, clothed and in his right mind if you want to have a right mind if you want to get your act together your life together the only way you're ever going to do that is to come to the realization that you have a need and that need is jesus christ he'll help you think properly and operate your life properly and that's what happened so jesus is done verse 21 jesus had again crossed over by boat. Hey, this ain't a bad deal. If you like being on boats, pretty good deal. He's going from one side of the lake to the other, the Sea of Galilee on a boat. I think that's a pretty good deal. <clears throat> on the other side of the lake, a large crowd is already there. So I'm guessing, and I don't know, I should probably look up where he was here, maybe headed back towards Capernaum, where he is very popular, but a large crowd gathers around him while he was by the lake. Of course, here he is. He's famous, man. People are coming around. He's healing people. He's preaching. He's giving the oppressed hope. And he's drawn a crowd. Then one of the synagogue rulers. Now, this is interesting because we know when the experiences that Jesus has had in the synagogue, he's been throwing uh, demon-possessed people or healing demon-possessed people in the synagogue. And the, the leaders of the synagogue, the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees, want his life. They have already plotted to kill him. That was two chapters ago. But look at this. Then all of a sudden, and this is common, one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there seeing Jesus and fell at his feet. This is the thing. America and Christians and individuals, sometimes we have it too good. And the reason I say that is because when you have things that are going well, you're in a position of, you're in a position, you have a title, you have power, and you're a manager, for example. You think you're a leader, but you're a manager. And basically, um, he has a need. He's got it good. He doesn't see his need. And when we have it good, we don't see our need. We don't see our sin. We don't see, we don't need God. We're good to go here. But when things go crazy, guess where we go? Right to Jesus, right to the nearest Christian, right to my Bible, right to praying. And so this man doing well, finally hits rock bottom. And unfortunately, some of us have to get there before we realize we have a need in Christ Jesus. He hits rock bottom. He sees Jesus come and he falls at his feet. Now he knows that the people that he's around want to kill this man, but now he's got a problem. And he pleaded earnestly with him, and this was his plea. My little daughter is dying. Please come put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. Now, he knows as a Jewish leader that for Jesus to touch a person who is sick or dying would contaminate him, would ruin him, would make him unclean and make him unable to come into the synagogue and worship because he would be considered unclean. But he says, come touch her, whatever it takes. Isn't it interesting how you're willing to break the rules when you have a problem, when you have a need, when we have a need? Hey, man, I'll do anything for my children. Wouldn't you? I would too, absolutely. And so he does that. Now he's like, I'm, I'm, I'm in a ruling class. I'm leading the synagogue. Uh, I'm around people that say, I'm going to kill, we're going to kill this guy. But now my daughter's sick. And I have a need. And who's the only one that's healing people? The very guy that we want to kill. And he goes to him. He falls on his face. And he says, please, my daughter is dying. Please come. Put your hands on her. Something they wouldn't normally do. Break the rules. Hey, remember, they were pulling grain just a little bit ago. And they wanted to kill the disciples for pulling grain on the, uh, on the Sabbath. They're eating. That's work. You can't do that. We want these guys dead. They need to be charged. This is blasphemy. But now, put your hands on her. Break the rules, my daughter's sick. This is what happens. So what does Jesus do? He, he goes, you guys are trying to kill me. Why would I want to come help you? No, isn't that interesting? He doesn't say that at all. So it says, so Jesus went with him. Yeah, he says, please come put your hands on her so she will be healed and live. Look at his faith. All of a sudden, he believes in Jesus. I got a need. 9-11, the churches were full after 9-11 in America. Formerly empty, churches were packed. Everybody was united after the attack on the World Trade Centers at, in 9-11. We're all united, let's go. Now we're all divided again. Why? Because there's no need. We're living in prosperity. Now there's a need. 
Please come touch her and she will live. So Jesus went with him. I love the fact that he doesn't hold that against him. A large crowd followed and pressed against him. That means it's a similar thing as like um, if uh, one of the famous soccer players or somebody was, you know, a basketball player. You know how it is. A mob gets around them. They're just pressed in. They're touching them. They're climbing all over them. Jesus is walking. And it pressed, the crowd is pressing around him. Verse 25. And a woman, ladies, don't think that there should be any prejudice against women. Now, there's, there's rules in the church, obviously, but a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. So he's walking with a leader. He's walking with the synagogue leader, a man in this day and age were leaders. The women were pretty much property at this point. But look at what Jesus does. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and we're there today. How many of you are, have a list of pills that you're taking to get better? But have you prayed yet? And I'm not saying God is instantly going to heal you, but have you prayed? Fallen on your knees before God and said, heal me. I got 37 pills I take every day. I've had 16 surgeries. God, can you heal me? You know, we're looking at men for the, the, the solution. We're looking at government for the solution to our problems. And Jesus is there the whole time saying, hey, if you come to me, I'll heal your land. And I believe he would. He absolutely would. He promises that. So a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She suffered a great deal in the care of many doctors. She spent all she had spending it on men's solutions to a problem that she has when Jesus is there the whole time. So don't look to men for the solution. Look to God. Obviously, there's men in positions that do a great job. and we, But, but it, we shouldn't just be solely dependent on men. We must look to Christ. For solutions to our problems and so she got worse instead of getting better and sometimes that happens even today when you take pills you get worse my dad was on 12 pills one time went to a different doctor ended up with two and got better uh, when he when he was sick with asthma so when she heard about Jesus she came up behind him in the crowd and she touched him again and touching him makes him contaminated unclean unfit for worship but she takes this risk why she's gonna break the rules to touch a man in public, um, knowing it's wrong. Why? Because she's desperate as well. And this is what we, why do we have to go to the, the rock bottom, become desperate to reach out and touch Jesus Christ? Why can't we do that in the good times? And, and I, I know when we pray at home, we're always like, you know, God, thank you for what we have. Or thank you for what we already have. And we are grateful. And so don't forget, you've been blessed already. Don't wait to hit the, to, the rock bottom to reach out to Christ and touch him. He wants to walk with you now in your success, in your failures, whatever, but he wants to walk with you now. Because she thought, if I touch his clothes, I'll be healed. And she was correct. And we are correct. If you go to Christ, if this nation, America, if this world would come to Christ and repent and worship him as Lord and Savior, a lot of our problems would go away. Why? Because we would no longer be self-centered, looking out for number one. We'd be looking out for the greater good. Immediately, her bleeding stopped. She felt it in her body that she was freed from her suffering. And you know what? When you come to Christ as a sinner and you say, God, forgive me. Here's my sin. I'm sorry. I repent. I'm going to follow you from now on. Because you are healed just as instantly from your sin. It's forgiven. It's forgotten. And it's gone forever. No, no, it's not. God's not going to heal you. He's not going to. Don't go to God and say, God, I need to be healed of this problem. I, I, have a, I, I have a problem in my life. I need a solution. If you're doing that, to just go and continue sinning. So God, if you, if, you, um, if you fix my problem, if you forgive me of my sins, and I'm going to go continue to live the life that I live, God isn't going to heal you, by the way. If you come in, you say, I repent. Here's my problems. I'm going to go the other direction. I'm going to quit sinning. Because that's what Jesus always said, go and sin no more. I'm going to quit. He's not going to heal you and fix your problem so you can continue to sin and sin more. He will heal you when you come in and repent and make him Lord and Savior, not just a mere healer. He's not there to just fulfill your wish list. So let's get right with God and he'll start healing our problems. She comes in and says, Lord, I want to be healed. I'm going to live. And she probably already is just desperate to live a different life because she's been suffering. Immediately her bleeding stopped. Immediately you'll be healed from your sin. Immediately you'll begin a new future. Immediately you become a new creation in Christ Jesus when you make him Lord. She was freed from her suffering. Again, look at women. Jesus took a time 
watching with walking with the ruler of the synagogue, a very prominent man, he took the moment to stop and address this lady's problem. So don't, ladies, don't get caught up in this. The church is discriminatory. And if they are, you're wrong. They shouldn't be that way. So at once Jesus realized the power had gone from him, he turned around. He turned around. He, she has got his attention. He's focused. He's got to go see Jairus' daughter. He's walking with the ruler. He's walking with his men. But he stops and turns around to take the moment to talk to a woman. He goes, who touched my clothes? The disciples then say, you see people crowding around against you, and yet you ask, who touched me? How in the world is anybody going to know that? Because he has what's called epinosis. Epinosis is supernatural power, supernatural knowledge. He has supernatural wisdom in his humanity. He still has the abilities as God to uh, know these things. Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. What is he waiting for? The woman to identify herself. He knows who it is. But he literally is waiting for her, and just like you. In a, in, a, in a planet full of 9 billion people, God knows you by name. As a matter of fact, Matthew 10, 30 says, he's even numbered the hairs on your head. So, 9 billion people, and you're as important to him as anybody else, because he's numbered the hairs on your head, Matthew 10, 30. So, how important are you? Who knows you that well? Your own parents don't know you that well. But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. When the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, she told him the whole truth. I touch you. I know it was wrong, but I had to do it. And she's desperate. Isn't it interesting how we break the rules and how we do things that are unusual when we're desperate? Worshiping God in this day and age is unusual. But man, when you hit rock bottom, you'll do it. He said to her, daughter, isn't that amazing? He didn't say, listen, heathen woman or, or property, daughter. That's awesome. This is what God's going to say to you. Ladies, if you're out there and you're struggling with something, if you need forgiven of your sins, you know what he's going to say to you? He's not going to say sinner, uh, whatever derogatory name. He's going to say, daughter, I'm so glad you showed up. I'm so glad you came. Your faith has healed you. She believed. She believed in Jesus. She was desperate. She'd given up on all the advice of men, and she came to the source of life, Jesus Christ, her Savior, and he said, daughter. Isn't that cool? Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Go in peace. Go. You're healed. Thanks for coming, daughter. Glad to meet you. Have a good day. So while Jesus was still speaking, some of the men, here come the men, ladies. Here come the men from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. All these men, synagogue ruler, Jesus takes a moment to heal a woman who he doesn't know but calls her daughter. Isn't that cool? He knows the supernatural. But anyway, <clears throat> your daughter is dead. It's too late. You blew it. Your mission is not accomplished. And they said, why bother to teach you anymore? Uh, and so Jesus ignores this. He's not even, you know, they're saying it's hopeless. It's over. We, here come the men. We're going to give you our advice. It's done. This is worthless. Your, your trial, your, your, uh, your attempt to go get Jesus is worthless. There's, it's fruitless. Just, just send him on his way. It's over. Too bad. You missed it. And Jesus ignores what they said. Jesus told the synagogue ruler, could you imagine? That? This is what, like, when you're when you're got a leader in the military or something's going bad, you know crap's gonna hit the fan for lack of a better word. But your leader looks you in the eyes and says, "Guys, pull it together. We're gonna get this mission done." And then you get this. All right, we are gonna get this mission done. Hey, what we need today are leaders with some backbone, some guts, and get out there and say, "You know what? We're gonna do this. We're gonna get it done." And uh, and and let's let's roll. So anyway. The synagogue ruler, your daughter's dead. All this negative, negative, negative. And Jesus ignores what they said. He looks at the synagogue and says, don't be afraid, bro. Just believe. And he did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John. So this is Jesus' inner circle. When I, Again, when I counsel leaders, company leaders, CEOs, presidents, um, I always say, get three people you trust. Where do I get that from? The Bible. Jesus had three men. Ladies, men, if you're out there, if you're listening, Get three people you trust. You don't need 15 friends. You don't need 100 friends. Oh, it might make you feel good. Look at all my friends. You need a couple people you trust and you can rely on. And I know the guys that are in power and influence, they're pulled in so many directions. You guys know I'm telling you the truth. And I'll tell them, you've got to block out all these voices. And that's what Jesus says. Blocks out all these voices, all these naysayers, and he picks three people he trusts. They're his inner circle of trust. 
Peter, James, and John. I tell everybody that's in leadership, do that. Find three people you trust. It's biblical. Listen to them. If it makes you trust or qualify them. So don't be afraid. Just believe. He did not anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, and who was the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue ruler, here he is, another ruler. Again, a position means nothing to Christ. He's just a man. Uh, and he let that woman interrupt their walk. Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. Though there were people in this day and age that were paid to do that, or that was their mission. You know, uh, I remember being in the military. You, you wouldn't see anybody on base or at the battalion or anything like that. And But when you got deployed or you went somewhere or something happened, man, the people came out of the woodwork. Why? They just wanted to be around it. They wanted to be around something you were doing. They wanted to be a part of the moment. They weren't going to get deployed. They weren't going overseas. They weren't going to jump out of airplanes. They weren't doing any of that. But they wanted to be around it. They wanted to say they had something to do with it. And uh, it's crazy, but it happens. It's the truth. And so here this girl's dying. And so people want to be around it. They're wailing and crying. They want to be a part of the moment. So he went in and said to them, <clears throat> what's all this commotion? What's all this wailing? This child is not dead. He's asleep. My other true colors are about to come out. Here they are. But they laughed at him. Jesus, who's touching you? How can you possibly know? We're laughing at you. How, what do you mean she's sleeping? You're out of your mind. And Jesus ignores it all. And you know what? People are laughing at you and ridiculing you, and you know what you're doing, and you're focused. Don't let people distract you from your goal. Go achieve what it is you have in your heart to achieve. Be a leader. Have some backbone. Have some guts. Go accomplish your mission. Quit listening to the naysayers and drive on. So, but he laughed at them. They laughed at him, excuse me. After he put them all out, I love that. He takes authority. He says, you know what, guys? You got to go. Get out. He throws them out of the house. And, and there again, Jesus is not a wimpy leader. A lot of people, well, he's a sheep. He's this. He's soft. He's, he's not. He throws these people out of the house. You guys are a distraction. You got to go. I'm weeding you out. And you got to weed the distractions out of your own life. After he put them out, he took the child's father, mother, and the disciples who were with them. Who were they? Peter, James, and John. So here we have the leader of the synagogue, the mom. Hey, lady, there it is. He is respectful to the father. He takes the father, who is Jairus. He takes the mother. She goes with him. And then he takes the three, Peter, James, and John, and himself. So six people go into the room. And when they were with the child, a young girl, he took her by the hand. And the reason I said, this is leadership. He's undistracted by the naysayers. He's concentrating on the people he cares about. He stops and heals the woman, regardless of the crowd around him. This isn't management. This is leadership, guys. We got a mission. We're going to get it done. He goes into the house, and I love this. This is your leader, Jesus Christ, takes the child by a sick child. Again, in Jewish law, this is not something you do. And if you're troubled, again, he will take you by the hand, male or female, guys. It's hard for men to admit, you know what, I got a problem. It was hard for me to tell my church, I had a heart attack. I need some help. They bailed on me, but that's all right. That's what they wanted to do. But um, took her by the hand. And I wish, honestly, that some of the people in our church would have done that. They didn't. And, and they, they took her by the, he took her by the hand, and he lit, picked her up and said, Talitha Kuhn, which means little girl, get up. How cool is that? Hey, are you down? Are you beaten down? I'm sure you are. Some of you are. The world's beating us down. And Jesus wants to say, here, give me your hand. Get up. And he's going to walk with you. Little girl, I say to you, get up. This is what I like about this. She's, I wrote these down. True leadership. She's a 12-year-old female. She's, he's in their house as a leader. He's at their house. His plan was not interrupted. He was going to heal this girl, regardless of everybody beating on him and dragging him in different directions. Against the status quo, he goes to a, heals a female and heals another female. He, he uh, takes this little girl by the hand. He lifts her up touches her when she's unclean. She's full of disease. She's full of death if she's really dead. <clears throat> and he gets her up. And then I think there's a little bit of humor there. This is just a Rob thing. This is not a scriptural thing. Little girl, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up. If you're down and you're beat down and Jesus touches you, you can get up. He's going to give you the strength to get up. Get back in and fight another round. Immediately, the girl stood up. She was 12 years old. Now, this is intimate detail. How intimate is a leader with the people that follow him or her? They know their name. They know who they are. They know their ailments. They know how old they are. They know details. That's a leadership. She's 12 years old. 
At this, they were completely astonished. And then he gave strict orders, please don't tell anybody about this. Keep this amongst ourselves. I don't need, you know, I'm not here to gain fame as a reputation. I'm doing what God, my Father, has sent me here to do. I'm healing people. I'm going to go to the cross. I don't need notoriety. I don't need fame. And that's what would happen if they spread the news. So he says, please don't tell anyone about this. And I'm sure they did. You would too, and I would too, if somebody healed my child. And then he says, and this is a Rob thing, give her something to eat. Hey, this kid's thin. This kid's skinny. Go get something to eat. I mean, I've heard women say when they watch models on TV or whatever, that girl needs a steak sandwich or something like that. And I think I just thought that was cute. Give her something to eat. This kid's too skinny. Give her something to eat. And I think, I think that was kind of maybe, maybe even a, some humor. They're excited. The daughter's alive. She's up walking around. Oh, give that kid a peanut butter sandwich. You know, I don't know. That's just a Rob thing. But anyway, I love the leadership. The difference between a leader and a manager is a leader understands the people that follow them. They lead by example. Jesus was out front, on point, focused, undistracted by all the distractions around him. He accomplished the mission he was there to accomplish. He took a little side mission with the lady who had the issue of blood, but he healed her too. <clears throat> and I love that. He stopped for a moment. He turned around. Hey, guys, we got time for this. Let's hit this. Got this fixed, turned, went back on his mission, back on point, got to Jairus' house. Unfazed by the people who said, you're too late, you can't do it. Hey, listen, man, people are going to tell you, you can't do it. People would rather see you fail than succeed. Look at that statistic, that's legit. But you know what? Stay on point, go accomplish what it is in your heart to accomplish. What dream it is you're going to accomplish. Jesus did that, and this is the example. He's a leader, not a manager. He's on point, he gets to the mission. He stays undistracted. He goes to the girl's house. He heals her and says, get up and walk. And then, hey man, give her something to eat. So anyway, that's the lesson for today. That's Mark chapter 5, 21 to 43. Hope everybody has a great day. And we'll start, we'll see you tomorrow.